Reynolds with Export Solutions, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is titled Export Regulations Year in Review. Um, we've got a lot of people signed up for this session, and some of them are still joining. And so I'd like to take the first few minutes to just go through some administrative and housekeeping things, and then I will introduce Emily Armstrong, today's speaker, and we will get right into the content. I hope everybody's having a good day, and thank you for joining us. First thing, just to uh, just to call out, and this is from our lawyers, but um, we do want to make a disclaimer at the beginning of the session. Uh, we are experts in ITAR and EAR regulations. That's what we do, of course, and that's why all of you are here. However, uh, I just wanted to draw your attention to this disclaimer, which basically says that although the information and advice we're providing is accurate, uh, if, if for any reason what we explain here or what is part of these slides uh, disagrees with the actual regulations themselves and the government agencies that control these regulations, then obviously those those agencies and those documents are the controlling source. So uh, I just wanted to point that out to you. And another small, I guess, disclaimer or notice is that we are recording this session. So by being on this session, you are agreeing to be recorded. And uh, we do that for people who can't join. Um, a lot of folks sign up for these and then for whatever reason with scheduling and, and work and stuff like that, they're not able to join the session. So the recordings are available on our website. <clears throat> they are free. And you will also be able to get a copy of the slides. So I just want to also draw your attention to the fact that we are recording this. For those of you on the phone and who are dialed in and can hear me, it doesn't really matter much and, and doesn't make much of a difference because everyone will be muted during the session. So uh, it isn't like your voice will be recorded. But we did want to make that notice to you. Just some quick things on how this webinar works and how we're going to proceed for this session. Hopefully everyone can see the slides that we are presenting and you can hear my voice. Uh, there are two audio options that you can use to join. One is through your computer speakers or there is a telephone number with an access code that you can use to join the conference call. And then, of course, the uh, slides are presented through GoToWebinar. We have had some issues in the past where people have firewall issues or problems downloading the GoToWebinar app. Um, and so that's another reason why we do provide these sessions afterwards, because we have folks who, you know, for whatever reason, sometimes people can hear us, but they can't see the slides or vice versa. And if you have any problems like that during the session, please feel free to send us a message and chat, and we will try to resolve it for you if, if possible. We do want to hear from you, and we want to have dialogue with you. However, because of the large number of people that are on this call, the best way that we've found to do that over the years is to keep everyone muted during the session. So there won't be any uh, any audio from any of the participants. Everybody is muted right now and will stay muted during the entire session. However, there will be opportunities for questions and interaction with us and we would like that and we would encourage that. The way to do that is either through the chat feature or the questions feature on your GoToWebinar toolbar. So if you look on the toolbar, you should see a dialog box for chat or questions. And at various points throughout the session, if you would like to submit a question, we will take as many of them as we can, and we will address those. <clears throat> I will say that if your question is too detailed or too specific to your company, we may ask to table it and discuss it with you offline. So just be aware of that. And then the other thing, too, about questions is everyone will remain confidential. So if you do submit a question to us, we will not read your name or, or your company info as part of that question. So you can rest assured that uh, anything that you submit through will be confidential for the large audience here. One of the questions that we get all of the time, and I like to address it up front, for any of you who, who may already be asking this or wondering it, is can you send me a copy of these slides? Uh, the answer is that the slides are available or they will be available on our website, typically within a week of, of the session. So about a week from now, if you go to exportsolutionsinc.com and you click on the webinar, 
link from our homepage. You'll go to a section called Archive Webinars, and there is where you will be able to find the recording and a download copy of these slides in PDF form. The only stipulation or condition that we put around the slides is that they're for your internal company use only, and uh, they may not be sold or transferred, et cetera, without our permission. This session is free. We do have a number of free webinars that we offer throughout the year. Uh, right now for 2017, we don't have any planned, although check back because we, we may be adding some in the future. Uh, however, if you do go to that section under archive webinars, we have probably four or five years worth of uh, free webinars that we've been doing and uh, all of those resources are available to you. So if there's a particular topic or something that you want to learn more about, more than welcome to go to our website and, uh, and check that stuff out. So at this point, I just want to introduce today's speaker. Emily Armstrong is a trade compliance consultant, and uh, she's been with us for a number of years, although Emily has uh, 17 years of trade compliance expertise and extensive knowledge and experience in assisting companies with EAR, ITAR, OFAC, and U.S. Customs regula uh, regulations and compliance. Emily specializes in assisting companies in the oil and gas, chemical, aerospace, defense, and high-tech sectors. She is very adept at optimizing their compliance systems, conducting export assessments to identify gaps, and determining recommendations to improve their export operations. And Emily also has extensive experience in writing export compliance process manuals and procedures, as well as conducting training on complying with U.S. and foreign regulations. Emily is a graduate of the University of Northern Colorado, where she majored in international trade relations, and she's also fluent in German. So I know we have uh, a majority of U.S. folks on the, on the call, although I do see some foreign companies. Again, we're not going to be talking to you directly, but if you submit a question in German, we may be able to, uh, <laughs> to field that. <laughs> <laughs> may is the key word there. Um, Emily joins us today from Windsor, Colorado, um, and how are things there, Emily? How are you doing? Doing well today, thanks. Great. Well, we're <coughs> ready to get started, so I will turn it over to you, and uh, I know this is a very popular session, a lot of interest expressed in this, and uh, I think everyone kind of wants, there have been a lot of changes to export regulations <coughs> in recent years, and particularly in 2016, so we're going to hit on some of those highlights. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, we're going to go through a lot of different changes that have happened over this over this past year. Of course, we're not going to be able to capture everything, or you'd be here all day. So I'm just going to try to go through some of the highlights and uh, keep in mind that this isn't going to be all inclusive. That there may be some that affect your company that we have not listed here today. <clears throat> I'm going to get started first with the harmonized destination control statement. This is probably something that affects most of you. This became effective November 15th of this year. And so um, now the harmonized destination control statement will be both the same for the ITAR and the EAR. I've listed that here for your reference. I'm not going to read it to you. Um, <clears throat> But as a, in addition to the changes of the actual wording, um, the requirements for the destination control statement have also changed. So now for both the ITAR and the EAR, the new destination control statement is required to be on the commercial invoice only. So previously the regulations had said that it needed to be on the airway bill, bill of lading, and the commercial invoice. So that's something uh, that has changed. So hopefully that will positively reduce um, some of your uh, paperwork when it comes to exports. <clears throat> so in addition to um, that change with the commercial invoice, there's some changes to some of the other requirements as well. Um, in particular, when you are exporting ITAR items, the commercial invoice now must specify the country of ultimate destination, the end user's name, the license and approval number um, of that particular item. If you have a, a, a shipment that includes both uh, an EAR item and an ITAR item, you'll now need to include that ECCN or that export control classification number um, in addition on that ITAR shipment. 
again, that's if you have a shipment that includes both ITAR um, and EAR items. <clears throat> Um, in regards to the EAR, the destination control statement is required on shipments of tangible items subject to the EAR. If you have EAR 99 items uh, or items that are going under the license exception for baggage or gifts, that destination control statement is not required to be on your documentation. If you have shipments of 600 series or that, uh, that 9X515 item, and those items are exported tangibly, um, you need to include the ECCN on that commercial invoice. So again, 600 series items include that ECCN on the commercial invoice as well as that new destination control statement. <clears throat> so take a look at your documents. Uh, make sure that you've updated this since this rule is effective now. This year, there were a few sanctions that were lifted. In October, uh, President Obama signed an executive order that terminated the Burmese sanctions that had been administered by, <clears throat> excuse me, administered by OFAC. So, under this executive order, it removed some SDN parties. For those of you who aren't familiar with OFAC, that's a specially designated nationals. So, those were that had previously been blocked under the Burmese sanctions have been lifted. The executive order also unblocked any property that had been blocked under the sanctions. It lifted the ban on the importation of Burmese rubies and jadeite into the U.S. and then removed some controls on the banking and financial transactions. There are still some uh, restrictions under FinCEN, so if you deal with Burma, be sure to review those as well. Uh, many of you may remember last year when OFAC terminated the Liberian sanctions. Uh, in May of this year, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution um, that terminated an arms measure that affected Liberia. So that has now been lifted. Um, so now we no longer have OFAC Liberian sanctions, and those UNSC <clears throat> sanctions have been terminated as well. In addition to these changes, DDTC announced that it lifted the arms embargoes that had been place, in place for Sri Lanka and Ivory Coast. So for Sri Lanka, the arms embargo had been in place since 2008, and then that uh, for Ivory Coast that had been in place since 2004. So in addition to these two, um, the arms embargo against Vietnam was lifted. There had been parts of this that had been lifted in the past passed for non-lethal weapons, so what changed this year was that arms embargo for lethal weapons um, for B Vietnam was lifted, and this was in May. I'm going to move back to OFAC uh, for a minute to discuss the Joint, Comprehension, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, known as the JCPOA. Um, this went into effect in January 16th of 2016. This was the implementation day, so this was the day that the IAEA had verified that Iran had met the requirements and implemented what they were supposed to in regards to their nuclear activities. <clears throat> so as a result of this, there were a few changes that had been made uh, in regards to those sanctions. Um, so on implementation day, the nuclear-related secondary sanctions were lifted. So these are sanctions that are generally directed towards non-U.S. persons, and these are for activities occurring outside of the U.S. Um, jurisdiction. So um, most of you probably won't have been affected by those secondary sanctions being lifted. <clears throat> In addition to those secondary sanctions, about 400 people and entities were taken off of that Iranian SDN list. Now, currently U.S. persons are still generally prohibited from dealing with Iran. There are some activities that are exempt, and these were generally exempt in the past as well, but I'm just going to name them for you. Um, these would be agricultural community, er, agricultural commodities, sorry, medicine and medical supplies. And again, um, these were already in place prior to the JCPOA, so you shouldn't see a whole lot of changes with those. Um, also on implementation day, OFAC issued a licensing policy allowing for case-by-case -case licensing of individuals and entities who are wanting to export, re-export, transfer uh, commercial passenger aircraft as well, and this affects parts and services too. Um, a general license was also issued authorizing U.S. owned or controlled foreign entities to engage in certain activities with Iran. Uh, one of the 
general licenses affected uh, food and Iranian origin carpets. So uh, in particular pistachios and caviar if any of you are dealing in those. If you have any specific questions about the JCPOA, uh, in October OFAC updated the FAQs on their website. So this is a really good resource. Um, again, just very specific things that have been lifted and specific changes with those Iranian sanctions. As many of you probably already know, ACE has taken place of that old AES system, and by the end of 2016, it's going to be the primary tool for reporting both imports and exports. Um, another change that, that is really helpful to exporters is that ACE has begun decrementing BIS license values. So when you when your license values have been met or exceeded or you're reaching that 10% shipping tolerance, you should now be getting a notification from ACE letting you know of that. Um, this is going to be helpful for a lot of you who currently use the spreadsheet decrementation method. I would still suggest using that because you don't want to be in a situation where you run out of your license value and now you're having to wait for a new license to come in place. So I would still keep your measures that you're doing now, but this will add an extra um, level of protection for you, for those of you uh, using BIS licenses. Here's a change to the commerce control list in regards to crude oil. Um, <clears throat> in May, this change removed the short supply license requirements that it applied to exports of crude oil from the U.S. These were previously in 1C981, so now crude oil is classified under EAR 99. There's still going to be restrictions that apply, of course, in regards to embargoes, restricted, restricted parties, um, but for the most part that crude oil now can, can be classified under EAR 99 and those short supply license restrictions have been lifted. Some more changes made by BIS. The Special Iraq Reconstruction License has been removed. They looked at this, they realized it was outdated, it was seldom used, and, uh, and took it out as a result. Another amendment made to license exceptions was to license exception TMP, specifically for exports to Mexico. Typically, TMP items need to be returned within a year. However, um, under this change, an exception was made for the MX program. These are Macador. <laughs> I'm not going to try and pronounce it again. It's not coming out. But <laughs> um, uh, for the MX program in Mexico, um, those items now can remain into, in Mexico for up to four years from that date of export or re-export. So um, this will no, no doubt be helpful to those of you using that TMP license exception. In October, BIS announced that it's going to allow exporters to file their anti-boycott reports electronically. This is through the OAC webpage, that's the Office of Anti-Boycott Compliance. Other than being able to submit electronically, nothing else has changed. They still have the same submission deadlines uh, in that the reports have to be submitted by the last day of the month following the calendar quarter when you receive the request and then what you need to report has also stayed the same. This is optional. Um, down the road they may make it mandatory that you submit electronically, but as of now um, it is optional whether or not you're going to use that automated system. Emily, this is Tom. Um, can we pause for a moment? We, we do have some questions coming in and they're related to some of the topics you've already covered. So before we get too far into other changes, I would like to address these if we can. Sure. Okay, first question. Um, this is related to the new destination control statement. The question is uh, for the new DCS, do we have to add the USML category to the commercial invoice? So the rules, the new rules that came out regarding destination control statement did not, don't address that specifically, but when you have an ITAR item, uh, you should have that USML category on your commercial invoice as well as the information um, regarding the license that it's going under. So that information should be on your, on your commercial invoice anyway. Great, thanks. Next question, this isn't related necessarily to the reform changes, it's more of a general compliance question. 
but the question is we are exporting a product which is EAR99. However, the product contains one or more components that are export controlled. What is the final classification? I think we probably need so more info on that. But you, go ahead. Yeah, I need a little bit more information if you have controlled items um, in an EAR99. I guess we would really need to look at how you arrived at ER99 if you have controlled items within that item and then what that item is. So that's probably uh, uh, something that we'd need to delve a little farther into. Or are, you, are, are we talking about the, uh, an ER99 and then controlled items on a shipment in regards to the destination control statement or that was just a general classification question? I think it's just a general classification question. It says the product contains more one or more components that are export controlled, which I assume that means at a, at a level higher than EAR 99. So I think it's... Yeah, then we would need to look at um, the reasoning behind the classification of EAR 99. Mm -hmm. Another question on DCS. Um, regarding the destination control statement, is it required to be printed on the re-export from a foreign subsidiary? <clears throat> no, it is not. Okay. These are for exports out of the U.S. Great. Well, we'll go ahead and continue forward with more of the of the content. And uh, folks, if you want to just continue to submit questions, we'll pause again here in the next few minutes and try to address as many of them as we can. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so let's delve into category five part two for those of you that deal with encryption. There have been a number of changes to this category um, and to the license exceptions that go with it. <clears throat> um, so this final rule was published in September as a result of the 2015 Wassenaar Agreement Plenary Meeting. What they've done now is divided Category 5 Part 2 into three subsections. So now we have Category 5A002 for cryptographic information security, 5A003 <clears throat> for non-cryptographic information security, and then 5A004 for defeating, weakening, or bypassing information security. So the result of this is that you may have some items that you had previously classified as 5A002 that may now be classified as a 5A003 or 5A004 as a result of those <clears throat> additional sections being added. Uh, the same license exception for those would still apply. So if your item under 5A002 is going to move under 5A003 and didn't qualify for ENC, it will still not qualify for that license exception. So really important um, to remember. 5A003 items are not eligible for ENC and are going to require licensing to all countries except for Canada. A couple other changes is 5B002, 5D002, and 5E002 were amended to account for those, um, those new subsections, so the information added for 5A003 and 5A004. <clears throat> Another major, major component of the changes were amendments to 5A992 and 5D992. So what now remains under those, under those ECCNs are mass market items. So if you have items that were previously classified under subcategories A and B, typically those items will now be EAR99. It's possible they could be 5A991 or 4A994, something that you'd need to specifically look at, but most of those items are probably now going to fall under EAR99. So in addition to the changes to the commerce control list, BIS also eliminated the registration requirement. Uh, because they eliminated that, they made changes to, um, they've taken out category, or sorry, they've taken out supplement five of part 742. Uh, Self-classification reports are still gonna be required to export some of the encryption items under ENC restricted or unrestricted. And then items falling under 74017B1, um, <clears throat> we'll still need a CCATS request filed. Um, but the change with that is that if you're filing under that, um, if you're getting a CCATS for those items, you're no longer going to require a self-classification report for those. So if you have a CCATS for items under 74017B1, uh, you're not going to need that self-classification report anymore. 
Uh, moving on to some license exception changes dealing specifically with uh, encryption. There were some amendments to uh, Part 74017B2. <coughs> Um, first, it's now authorizing exports of network infrastructure items to government users, dubbed as less sensitive. So they've added a definition of less sensitive government end users, um, and these are in all countries with the exception of E1 and E2. <clears throat> and we're going to discuss this um, in a couple minutes as well. They also added a, class, a clarification that government-owned schools and universities are in fact going to be viewed as government end users. Another change to 74017B2 in regards to uh, ENC is that now certain items in 58002D or E and the software related to them um, have been moved and are now controlled under a higher level of control. Also, the performance parameters in this section were updated. Um, the aggregate throughput was increased from 90 megabits per second to 250, they deleted the single channel input data rate and then they changed those media parameters from 1,000 endpoints for, to 250 to account for changes uh, in technology. They also added a carve out for mass market satellite modems that use end to end encryption between the modem and the hub and then um, moved uh, channelizing codes and spread spectrum to 74017B2. These would have been in 58002D and 58002A for those items. Another change to the encryption regulations are the changes made to publicly available encryption source code. Um, exporters now can notify, are required to notify BIS of the internet location of that source code and then um, and then once that's completed, the source code's no longer going to be subject to the EAR, so a major change with that. So after that notification, that source code is not going to be subject to the EAR. That used to be, um, it used to be controlled under TSU, so what they've done is they've moved um, the requirements under 742.15 out from under TSU. Under license exception TMP, now 5E002 encryption technology is available for tools of the trade. Um, so that provision is 740.9. Um, mass market encryptions that were previously exported under 7042.15 are now under 740.17. So again, just some moving, moving uh, um, from one place to the other still within the EAR. They've also just something somewhat insignificant. They took out those old grandfathering provisions. Those were from the encryption changes that happened in 2010, so they went ahead and took that out. They added Croatia to supplement three of part 740 and then revised those uh, supplement six questions in part 742. Um, this was to update those performance parameters that we talked about in the performance or in the previous slide. So um, those updated parameters are now uh, captured in Part 742, Supplement 6. So we talked about the definition, how the definition had been added for less sensitive government users, and here's that definition. So less sensitive government users um, are considered to be local, state, provincial government end users. Um, I'm not going to read the definition to you, but uh, I included some examples. So census, statistics services, civil public works, clean water infrastructure, these are going to be considered less sensitive government end users. And then on the flip side, you're going to have more sensitive government end users. Um, these are national, federal, royal government end users, for example, currency, monetary authorities, legislative bodies. Keep in mind, for less sensitive government end users, this does not include um, end users in country group E1 and E2. So that's the exclusion for less sensitive government end users. <clears throat> Another significant change that occurred this year is in regards to cloud computing. So BIS uh, issued a final rule effective in September that says that certain transactions meeting specific data requirements would not constitute an export. So if you're transmitting or storing data and it meets those specific standards, 
um, under the new rules an export would not have taken place. So these standards would be that the data needs to be unclassified, it needs to be secured using end-to-end -end encryption, it needs to be secured using um, FIPS compliant cryptographic modules and uh, or something more or something as equally or more effective and then those items cannot be intentionally stored in a military bar embargo country or in the Russian Federation so um, the information stored in the cloud cannot be in a country listed in D5 or in the Russian Federation. So uh, as a result of this change they also added a definition of end-to-end -end encryption so that's now defined as cryptographic means that protect data such that the data is not unencrypted between the originator and the intended recipient and where you're not releasing any of that decryption to third parties. <clears throat> so there is a slight carve out that says um, when the transfer occurs there um, there can be some decryption only if it's for technical reasons, if you're establishing a VPN connection or something like that. But during those periods of decryption uh, of that information, you need to be sure that, um, that no third party was able to access that. So hopefully this will um, open up some options for U.S. companies when they're looking at offshore data solutions or, or cloud storage. And one more thing I want to point out that these are changes under the BIS and not ITAR. So this change does not affect ITAR items, only those items um, under BIS. Okay, we're going to move on to um, some lengthy changes for export control reform. We'll start Can with, I... um, sure, yes. I was just, sorry to interrupt, but we have some encryption questions and also the cloud computing questions. So before we switch gears here, I want to just toss these out if that's okay. Um, sure. So the first question, this is about encryption, and the question is, is registration no longer required for all encryption items or just some encryption items? The requirement, the registration requirement has been taken out altogether. So that would affect all encryption items. All right, thank you. Another question here, where do I find the countries in D5? This is about cloud compute, your cloud computing slide that you just showed. So those are going to be located in part supplement 1 to part 740 of the EAR that shows all the country groups A through E, so you'll be able to find that country group D there. Perfect, thank you. Um, more of a general question here. Some people have said that ITAR rules will be removed soon or significantly relaxed since it provides many constraints for business businesses. Any news or comments about this? Is this in regards to encryption? No, I think this is more of a general ITAR question about, I think we're getting into it, so it's probably more of a question about export control. Yeah, so we're going to get into some of those changes. Um, there have been multiple changes that, that have relaxed some of the current controls um, under export control reform, and in the future we can expect to see more of those changes as well. Yeah, one thing I would add to that is I don't foresee the ITAR rules being removed uh, at any time soon, or I have not seen any any discussions about ITAR being removed altogether or anything like that. So I think that after, even after export control reform is completely implemented, you will, we will still have the ITAR in the United States. But to Emily's point, they are going category by category, and we're going to get into some of these categories now to, um, to significantly revise those going forward. <clears throat> Thanks, Tom. Okay, so Yep, let's, let's jump into uh, ITAR then. Okay, so uh, moving on through export control reform, it's now in its fourth year. Um, so the first, uh, there's been several changes that have been made. Uh, in July, we had two final rules that were published. Those were in category 14 and in category 18. Um, so in category 15, now forgive me as I stumble over some of these, these are not in my area of expertise, so um, I can't guarantee that I'm going to be able to uh, pronounce all of these things. But um, so those revisions uh, 
made in October remove certain toxicological agents and associated equipment from the ITAR controls and put them onto the commerce control list. So some examples of what was moved over to the CCL includes uh, tear gas, so riot control agents, some test facilities, and some equipment dealing with destruction of chemical bio agents. And those were moved over to a new ECCN category that was established, and that's uh, uh, the 600 series in category 1 or 1X607. Uh, these changes implement a risk-based tiering list with uh, Tier 1 pathogens and toxins being controlled under the ITAR. Uh, these Tier 1 items are established by the Department of Health and Human Services and the Agricultural Departments. So if we have items that are not meeting those specific uh, capabilities under the ITAR, they're going to be bumped over to the Commerce Control List in Category 1C. Three, or under ECCM 1C351 or 1C352. Uh, items that will now be listed on the USML include chemical agents for use in warfare, and these are the antibodies, antigens, and biopolymers um, are all now listed on the USML or will be listed. This rule is going to be effective at the end of this month. Another change under export control reform, also effective at the end of this month, is in category 18, which is directed energy weapons. This category is going to be revised to more specifically described item, describe items that are controlled on the USML. So moving out of a general approach, looking at something more specific where those items are going to be listed. Um, then we're going to have, uh, as a result, uh, certain tooling, production equipment, test and evaluation equipment, test models uh, related to directed energy weapons are going to move over to the commerce control list in um, the new ECCN 6X619. Again, we're moving over to more of a specific uh, list-based approach with some items moving over to the commerce control list as a result of that. Lastly, in October, the final rule for Category 12 was published. Uh, again, looking at more specific controls listed on the USML. Uh, one of the things to really look at for this ITAR category is that we're seeing a new concept with these revisions, and that's a concept of controlling certain articles based on the intended end user. So in certain paragraphs of these revisions, items are, going to, items are identified as defense articles if they're specifically designed for a military end user. That definition that they're using uh, is in the notes of Category 12 and is taken from the EAR definition that's in Part 744 of a military end user. Uh, so in that category now, the military end user is defined as National Armed Services, National Guard, National Police, Government Intelligence, or recon organizations, or any person or entity whose actions or functions are intended to support military end uses. So under this rule, if an item was developed for use by a military end user, then it would be considered to be specifically designed for that military end user. If you have an item that's developed for both military and non-military end users, or the item didn't have a specific end user, then it would not be considered specially designed for an end user really important that you have the documentation to back this up. So it's or is going to be required in order to, um, to show design intent here. Um, in addition to these changes and the changes within the USML categories, a new 600 series is added to accommodate those items moving over from Category 12, and that's going to be in Category 7. So new ECCN established 7X611. And we say 7X611 um, because it just depends if you have a material test equipment or an item software technology is going to determine what that second letter is. So it could be a 7A611 uh, or 7E661 or some of those other um, letters in those product groups if you're not familiar with the commerce control list. Okay, in order to continue the harmonization process between EAR and ITAR, several definitions have been amended this year under export control reform. 
Uh, these rules were published in June and updated the definitions of export, re-export, release, and retransfer under <clears throat> both the EAR and the ITAR. Again, the purpose, as is a purpose with all of export control reform, is to more clearly align um, the ITAR and the EAR. So these changes um, were published in June but became effective in September. So in terms of the definition of export, some things to look at is that DDTC uh, revised its definition. <clears throat> it removed some activities and, and uh, now those are activities are captured under re-export and retransfer. Um, in terms of uh, when we're talking about deemed exports, DDTC revised its text. Um, really important here to now read that it's releasing or otherwise transferring technical data to foreign persons in the United States. So here we're seeing ITAR, while um, deemed exports were previously um, controlled under technology transfer rules, they're really adopting the deemed export concept here that's been um, under BIS. Uh, something to note in the definition changes is that DDTC added the definition of release. <clears throat> Notable is that that, that definition um, contains two parts, the first part being visual or other inspection by foreign persons of a defense article that reveals technical data to a foreign person or oral or written exchanges with foreign persons of tech data in the U.S. or abroad. So <clears throat> when you're looking at these changes, really look at that definition, that keyword there of revealing that technical data. So it used to be before that it was just mere access to technical data. Um, now they're specifying that that technical data um, being revealed is considered to be a deemed export. So there hasn't been any formal cl clarification on this with DDTC and how this will change things, but uh, it is a very notable difference in the old regulations versus what has changed this year. <clears throat> Um, when we're looking at deemed exports, um, DDTC has confirmed that it's going to be reviewing all citizenships of foreign employees. So they're going to be um, looking at past countries, president citizenship, um, for uh, permanent residents when we're looking at deemed exports, whereas BIS, um, <clears throat> their deemed export review, or their deemed exports looks at the most recent country of citizenship. So definitely something to keep in mind when you're looking at how you're handling your, um, your deemed exports that BIS and DDTC is still going to continue to handle those quite differently. This year there's also been some changes in regards to penalties. Uh, in August, um, the penalty for ITAR violations was raised from 500000 to 1094000 This is an increase of over 100%, so very significant. This was something that was mandated by, con by Congress um, to make up for some adjustments to make some adjustments when it comes to inflation going forward. We're probably not going to see such increases of, uh, of large amounts, um, but gradual increases to account by for inflation and um, those are supposed to be implemented no later than January 15th of each year so um, January 15th if we're going to be seeing changes to account for inflation and those penalties that's when you'll be seeing them. Uh, the um, BIS also up their penalties not as significantly but their penalties increased from 250,000 to 284,582 or as also uh, as always as it has been twice the value of the transaction associated with that penalty or that violation. Emily this is Tom. One comment just to make on the uh penalties is that I believe the, the last time the ITAR penalties were increased was something like in the 80s, 1980 or something around that time. So it's been quite a while since they increased them. And uh, to your point, hopefully they will not be such big jumps going, going forward. Great. Thanks, Tom. A couple of other questions here. <laughs> this is related to ITAR and export control reform. Um, one question here is, can we define what is meant by exclusively funded by DOD? I think this goes back to one of your category changes that you were talking about. And the question is, 
if the item is purchased, purchased as a material as a result of an award for a defense contract, is it considered to be exclusively funded by DOD? Can you repeat that first part, Tom? Yeah, if the item is purchased as a material as a result of an award for a defense contract, so someone's purchasing a material because they've been awarded a defense contract, is that considered exclusively DOD funded? Again, this is something, and I hate to keep going back to this, but really looking at the, the details of the transaction and, and what that uh, material is and the, the, the parameters associated with it and with that funding. Yep. So for that person, you, we may need to take that offline with you, or if you provide us with some more details, we might be able to give you some, uh, some additional clarity on the phone here without without getting into too much of specifics, of course, about your transaction on this forum. Let us know on that. Another question about uh, the US mail categories, and they, somebody wants to know when category one for firearms will be updated for export control reform. So category one, those changes remain to be seen. Um, there are several categories that are listed as TBD on the DDTC website, and firearms is one of those. So a lot of people waiting for reform when it comes to that, and they just have not been issued yet. And I'll just add something to that. Um, the government is, is going through the easy, they're starting with the easiest categories and working through to the most difficult ones. And so one of one of the reasons why I think firearms has yet to be re reformed or you don't see changes coming to category one is because it's one of the most difficult for government and industry to, to wrap their arms around. So if that makes sense. Um, but to answer the question directly, nobody that uh, we don't know and, and to my knowledge, no one is aware of when that category will be revised. So if you have okay. other questions, um, folks, oh, yeah, go ahead and submit. continue to submit questions. We will try to get to as many of them as we can, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Okay. Some changes put up by the Department of Justice. So traditionally, export-related voluntary disclosures and self-disclosures are usually filed within DDTC, BIS, or OFAC. Um, but in October, the Department of Justice established a voluntary self-disclosure programs for violations of U.S. economic sanctions and export controls. Um, so this is meant to encourage companies who knowingly and willingly violate export control laws to also self-disclose to a Department of Justice. This would be in, in addition to um, any voluntary disclosures or self-disclosures that were filed with BIS or DDTC or OFAC. So in exchange for this, um, this would be a mitigating factor and um, the exporter would be eligible for a reduced penalty or fines, um, possible possibility of being entered into a non-prosecution agreement among some other things. So essentially, <clears throat> this type of disclosure like the others would be a mitigating factor when it comes to reviewing the case in particular. Also in October, a rule was proposed by the Department of Justice that required the Department of Defense to temporarily revoke a contractor's access to export controlled information if they have uh, substantial and credible information that that contractor has violated US, control, sorry, US export control laws. And this is uh, currently in the proposal phase, so a change to look forward to in the future. Okay, uh, so in order as part of export control reform to move closer to a single IT system, DDTC has acquired a new case management system to modernize its processes. So as part of this, um, DDTC, again, this is not a change that has been implemented, but has been coming, um, but public comments are being accepted for the rollout of some of these forms. <clears throat> Particularly the DS7788 is supposed to or planned to supersede the DSP5, 6, 61, 62, uh, 73, and 74. So this um, would be eligible to be used for the export, import, re-export, transfer, re sorry, reconsideration, and advisory marketing licenses. 
Um, so this no doubt will make things easier for exporters instead of handling those multiple um, applications. Another form coming um, <clears throat> is going to be the DS7787, which is going to permit filing of initial and final voluntary disclosures. Uh, it can also be used for extension requests, submission of supplemental information, third-party violation reporting, and for responses to DDTC questions. So just another avenue um, for those responses and requests um, under DDTC. And lastly, um, the 7789 form, which is planned to be used for the 50 and 60 day registration notification requirements when we're looking at mergers, acquisitions, uh, or divestments of a registered company. So these are just a couple changes, significant changes that are coming. Um, of course, there are um, more to come um, that we're not able to predict or that, that we're not sure of right now, but um, look for more changes coming. And this concludes um, what I have to say in regards to the changes that happened in 2016. Great, thanks, Emily. Um, we just still have some questions coming through, and so I will, uh, I will address these in as much as we can here, and if we, have, if we need to take the topic offline, we can do that as well. This one is a more of a general classification question. This is a follow-up to the question about the AR99 product from before. So just to provide some more details, a product was previously classified as EAR99, and now it has a component that is classified as 3A201. That component is a small part of the total product, less than 10%. What is the new ECCN number? So it had previously been EAR99 and a component was added that's a 3A201. Mm -hmm. But that is less than 10%, which would meet those de minimis requirements. So um, that, that, um, that calculation, though, is very specific as to what you can include and what you can't include in that. So again, this would be something that I would really look at what was added and how it changed, how that 3A201 changed that EAR99 item. Okay. Um, I hate to issue any specific advice on ECCNs because there are so many different yeah. factors that, that go into these classifications. No problem. Um, do have a question here about the slides? Yes, they will be available for all attendees. Uh, if you go to our website, typically within a week of this session, we will have this recording available for viewing, and we will also you will also be able to download the slides. Uh, the website is exportsolutionsinc.com, and you can click the webinar tab at the top of our page. Does anybody else have any questions for this for this session or this forum? There have been a few of them that are pretty detailed and specific, and I've, I'm recommending that we talk with those folks offline. So if anyone has any other additional questions, please submit them, and we'll be uh, happy to address them at this point. Emily, you have your materials done. Is that correct? No more slides from you? That's correct. Uh, here's a question about the DS7788 form. When when will that begin? Yeah, so if, uh, that, if you could give me that. Go ahead. Uh, the question no, sorry. Is, question is on the DS7788 form, this, this new form that DDTC introduces. Uh, when will that become effective or when will they start using it? They haven't let us know yet, um, so we're holding out hope for um, those forms to be available in 2017. As far as a specific date or month, I have no idea, unfortunately. Yeah, so they, this slide that we're looking at now, folks, just so you know, and to add to what Emily says, this is a proposed new rule, so it's been proposed and is out there. Um, they're receiving comments from industry, then they issue a final rule which will then put some future date in, in place when the form will become effective. 
and also just another um, thing to add to that is that the forms have to go through an internal government review with the Office of, uh, I think it's called the Office of Budget and Management or the OMB uh, group within the U.S. government. So um, probably the easiest way to answer that is not anytime soon <laughs> will these new forms be in. But it's the reason that I, I think this is hopeful is because <clears throat> this goes back to the start of export control reform. If you, if for those of you who have been around and who know export control reform or who've been following it for a number of years, you know the end goal is to have one control list, one agency that manages all of it instead of two agencies, you know a single IT platform that manages all of the licensed applications, et cetera. That's the kind of the goal that the U.S. government has been working on ever since President Obama announced these changes many years ago, and so. I think this slide here with the new forms that DDTC is introducing is, is just one more step in that direction uh, because they're taking what are numerous forms under ITAR, you know, the DSP-5, 661, 73, all of those, and they're consolidating them into one ITAR license application. The next step from there, obviously, would be to have a single license application for all all exports, whether ITAR or EAR. Um, we're still, we still have a ways to go to get there, but it is encouraging to see the government taking steps to try to implement that. Um, question here on the DOJ rule about re reporting violations. The question is, would this include all violations, no matter how minor? I think the key there is, Emily, you can jump in, but th this is so, a volu voluntary Yeah, this would include anything that... Go ahead. Yes, so um, this would be, if you, if you had planned, if you, like, the, the, like it says here, if you've knowingly and willingly violated export laws and you are self-disclosing those, um, that would be covered. So that would be something that you need to look at exactly what was violated um, uh, and what you're disclosing. Great, thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions? We have a few minutes left. Okay, Emily, thank you for taking time to go through this. Uh, I know that um, there's a lot of material covered. There have been a lot of changes over the last year, and we tried to hit on the highlights. And obviously, each one of these, there's there's a lot of detail that we could get into, but for time purposes and try to try to keep this content as manageable as possible, we weren't able to get into all the details. And I know we weren't able to address all of your questions either. So some of you who I've been communicating with offline please feel free to follow up with us. We'd be happy to try to talk specifically about your questions um, in, a more, uh, in a more private environment uh, than this. So feel free to reach out to us, go to our website, and uh, you, can, you can submit a no-charge consultation request, and we'll be happy to talk to you, or you can email us directly, and we will try to address as many questions as we can. But uh, Emily, thanks again for taking us through these changes. Uh, we appreciate everybody joining us today for this session. And again, look, look on our website for a recording of this and the slides. And we hope that you all have a wonderful holiday season. And uh, thank you for your interest in Export Solutions and for these webinars. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone.